Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by Prudential Financial, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, NJ Best, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, Summit Health, a provider of primary, specialty, and urgent care. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, here when you need us most, now and always. And by the Fidelco Group. Promotional support provided by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. And by NJ Biz, providing business news for New Jersey for more than 30 years, online, in print, and in person. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome again to another compelling program where we talk to big thinkers. Right out of the box, we kick off with Dr. Timothy Eatman, who is the inaugural dean and professor of the Honors Living Learning Community at Rutgers University in Newark, one of our higher ed partners. Dr. Eatman, so good to have you with us. Steve, it is so good to be here. Thank you for your leadership in illuminating this kind of work. Well, I want to illuminate your work right now because, you know, people hear this term, the Honors Living Learning Community at Rutgers North. First of all, what is the program and why is it so important? Yeah, the, the Honors Living Learning Community, Steve, is a new opportunity for higher education institutions to understand what honors is. Like the idea that standardized tests really should be the be all end all to let folks know what honors is, to let folks know what it means to identify positive change agents for the society is beneath where we think we should be. So the chancellor, uh, Chancellor Cantor and her executive team. Nancy Cantor. Yes, in, in their uh, process of developing a strategic plan, initiated the Honors Living Learning Community as one of the signature initiatives for uh, Rutgers Newark at this time. You know, Doctor, let me, let me try this one on you. As a student of leadership who comes from um, I'm a Rutgers alum, graduate school, doctoral program, part of the, taught at the Rutgers North Campus for many years. Um, leadership has always been at the core of my uh, teaching and learning focus. Question, from a leadership perspective, what impact do you believe this particular program will have, not just on the students who are in it, but on them as future leaders? Yeah, Steve, it's really quite powerful uh, for me. I uh, know that what we are doing in higher education at Rutgers Newark is really opening up the way that we understand what's possible. We're refusing to continually overlook local talent. So the Honors Living Learning Community is comprised of over 50% of Newark students. And see, these students want to stay in Newark. They got into Duke and Michigan and Syracuse and other places but we think it's honorable that they know the value of Newark, they want to stay in Newark, and we think they need support to do that. What could it do for a city like Brick City, Newark? What could it do for the city longer term? Well, I think the people who know the most about what kinds of things need to happen in the city come from the city, right? I've been in a lot of institutions all around the country, and most times students are way away from home and the community engagement projects that they do really are them visiting but these students steve are going home they're going to their synagogues and mosques and churches and they're doing these kind of ameliorative things that help to demonstrate the uh brilliance and the aspirations that they have and they are brilliant steve uh that they're bringing to bear within the newer community you know, let me let me try this. I'm, it's interesting. You, you, you use the term traditional models, whether we're talking about standardizing testing, Dr. Eatman, or whatever the more traditional models are in higher ed. What do those traditional models and teaching, learning approaches in higher ed, what do they do to, in fact, make it harder for a more diverse student body of honor students? 
Yeah, well, Steve, listen, if your mother has been paying for you to take standardized test prep from elementary school, you ought to be able to do good on it. Right? Yeah, you're right. A lot of practice. <laughs> a lot of practice. Uh, and listen, I'm a social scientist. Uh, people laugh when I say this, but, uh, you know, I'm a quantitative sociologist. I'll make a survey out of anything. And my socks roll up and down when I can explain the variance on variables and on the dependent variable. And these tests tell us what they explain, the variance, is about family wealth. That's what they explain. And, and that's okay. And listen, I'm not against uh, these sorts of tests. Listen, I have a daughter who's in an MD-PhD program right now. She took the MCAT. I want my surgeon to have done well on the MCAT. Don't get me there's wrong. A, there's a but coming, Dr. Eatman. There's a but coming. Go ahead. Yes. But if we are looking for dynamic, amazing leaders in a range of fields, I'm thinking of Vivian Peralta, who's off to Texas A&M with five-year full funding, uh, who's, uh, you know. Comes out of the program. She comes out of the, she's a graduate this year. Right. Uh, she's a, bi a biologist who's going to be a research scientist from Newark, but launching her into that space at, where she's doing that work in biosciences, but also socially conscious work is really critical. You know, you talk about being socially conscious. There's a social justice minor in this program. A, what is it? And again, it should be self-evident, but why is that? so critically important for these students and for the leaders they will be moving forward. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, it's, it's really, really important. I, sh I should say that the HLLC at its base is two things. It is a merit scholarship. The scholarship and that's, by the way, that's the acronym for the Honors Living Learning Community. Absolutely. My apologies. The Honors That's okay. We'll learn community. that acronym over time. <laughs> I hope we do. <laughs> yeah, I hope Newark really rallies and, and, and the whole world rallies around this model. Absolutely. Go ahead. Our, our vision is that it should be a, a national model. But the Honors Living Learning Community is a merit scholarship for room and board, Steve. It's not for tuition. It's for room and board. There are other ways that we work with students to assist them in getting uh, tuition uh, assistance. But it's also, as you mentioned, a curriculum. It's an 18 credit curriculum. So I mentioned Vivian before, she's a biology major, but her minor is in social justice. And so we have uh, three core courses that we do in the Honors Living Learning Community. Then the students have a set of electives and then they have a capstone and that comprises the, the experience. Real quick before I let you go, there's a, is there a Prudential Scholars Program? Woo! <laughs> you, yes, yeah, sir, you are talking about something really powerful. Uh, the Prudential Foundation had made a, a $10 million gift to endow a scholarship that we have mapped, Steve, to one of our pathways. It's called the Prudential Scholars um, uh, Scholarship, and uh, Newark students are able to enjoy uh, special resources in that context. I don't have more time to deal with it, to op unpack it, but I have to tell you that uh, Shanae Harris is the president of the foundation, and you know, uh, you know, Rob Falzon was is, was there and helped present the 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 award and organize the the bringing together of this real support. I mean, we our new eighty million dollar building is across the street from the Prudential Building, and so to be in fellowship with Prudential in this way, with uh, alumni like you, Steve, from Prudential, mentoring students, working closely with them under the guidance of Tiffany Williams and and at Prudential and others is really really powerful. Thank you, Dr. Reed. By the way, let me just uh, make it clear that the Prudential Foundation is a supporter of what we do as well in public broadcasting with the Caucus Educational Corporation. Dr. Eman, I cannot thank you enough. It's the first time you've joined us. It will not be the last. I hope not. No, it will not. We'll stay on this, and we wish you and, and the team at Rutgers Newark and Nancy Cantor, Dr. Cantor, all the best. Thank you. Steve, I, I really hope that we can come back and get some students and maybe other members of my team to work with you and to share this work. That would be great. Love to hear the stories. Thank you, Dr. Eatman. God bless you. Same Walk to you. Me. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Dr. Timothy Eatman. We'll be right back. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're now joined by our good friend John Sarno, president of the Employers Association of New Jersey. Good to see you, John. Good to see you. Good morning. You got it. Hey, John, listen, we're, we're taping on the 22nd of June. We'll be seeing later. Again, moving target here. The most significant workplace-related issues for employers would be? 
Right now, it's uh, making the transition back to um, post-pandemic environment. Um, very tricky, very complex. Um, I think that's probably the preeminent issue at the present moment. And quite frankly, going forward for the foreseeable future. So let's dig a little deeper here. There are some employers we've spoken to, for-profits, not-for-profits, academic institutions, et cetera, all employers. We're an employer, the Caucus Educational Corporation, PBS, they're employers. Why am I confused, and I'm not the only one, about whether employers can mandate that their employees get vaccinated? Well, uh, I think it's natural to be confused because, um, you know, New Jersey has been operating under several executive orders, right? So the state has its own authority to respond to a public health crisis. On the other hand, we have the CDC and the OSHA guidance. OSHA which, is a federal agency around safety and protection of employees. Correct. In the workplace. Sa safety and health. So um, oftentimes they uh, can be overlapping, but- uh, How about contradictory? In conflict, clearly. So I think that is, you know, probably accounts for why there might be uncertainty. And then you have the natural consequence of the vaccination being uh, voluntary. Um, we don't have a, a mandate uh, so that um, we're going to have probably close to 70% of adults at the end of the day fully vaccinated in New Jersey. Uh, many of them are in the workforce, uh, but that means that there is probably going to be 20 to 30% unvaccinated. So we are going to have a, um, a, a mixed bag with regard to who's vaxxed and who's not. But for employers, John, Devil's advocate question, do they not have a responsibility, don't they have a responsibility to protect all employees, potentially from COVID, by making sure that all employees are vaccinated? And if you're not vaccinated, letting that person into the workplace is, is risky. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, uh, under existing uh, law and labor standards, an employer can require an employee to get vaccinated. Now, if the employee has a um, disability or medical condition, then, then that might be an exception, but an employer could require the vaccine. There's no question about it. How about a religious exemption? Uh, yes, you'd have to accommodate a, a genuine, sincere religious uh, objection, uh, similar to a medical condition or a disability. Uh, How about those, a political objection? Uh, no, no, no. Um, you know, those First Amendment type free speech issues would not uh, uh, be uh, in play in, in a private uh, workplace. Now, if you're employed by a municipality, uh, a public employer, there might be a limited, a very limited uh, First Amendment right, but clearly the welfare and the safety and the health of the workforce would outweigh a, um, a, a kind of a free speech uh, type of argument that you can make even in a public right. workplace. Hey, John, do you, the whole, the whole concept of normal, back to normal, and then the term new normal. Yeah. How do you describe <clears throat> what you believe will be the so-called workplace of the future? Normal, new normal, back to normal, no normal? Well, well, that's, a, that's a great question because, you know, we have a tendency to be nostalgic and, and, and you know, sort of want to go back, go back to this. I want to go know, back. To this, to, to this ideal, you know, environment. But like the normal pre-pandemic, you know, really wasn't that, really wasn't that great for a lot of, workplaces and certainly for a lot of workers. I mean, stress levels were high. Uh, the, the World Health Organization uh, had identified work burnout as an occupational illness. Um, you know, all of this, all of this before the pandemic. So I, I, I think there's probably a, a once in a generation opportunity to create better workplaces. So, you know, I, I see the new normal not as going back, 
not trying to repeat what didn't work, but an opportunity to create better work for more people, better workplaces with health, safety, and engagement as, as the core human resource function. John, it's been 16 months since, in the Caucus Educational Corporation, our production company, not alone in this, 16 months since I believe this first, second week of March 2020 that we have not been in an office together, but we're all functioning. We have a great team behind the scenes, a great producers, director, audio, camera. I'm, I'm in this studio with Scarlin, who's operating our camera, but everyone else is remote. But we're not everyone else, meaning we can function in our workplace this way, I don't know for how long, and it may be for the foreseeable future, a long-winded way of getting to this. For those who don't fall into that category and can't do what we're doing like this, do they not all have to go back to the office together? I mean, precisely, you hit it right on the head. The, 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 the pandemic laid bare on multiple levels the inequities, both in the economy, in the workplace, and in, in our communities. So yes, you and I have had the privilege to work from home, right? by virtue of our occupation, by virtue of our education, uh, by virtue of the, the businesses that we run. But for 80% in the service economy, which has to work face-to-face, -face, um, they risk their lives. The essential workers put their lives at risk. Um, and uh, these are not like great paying jobs in any event. Healthcare, um, uh, you know, public, public service type jobs. So, um, you know, I, I think we're going to have to address those inequities because the normal, again, wasn't that great for these essential workers. John, and, uh, John I'm sorry for um, interrupting. I'm yeah, up against yeah. the break right here. Real quick, give sure. me 30 seconds on, I have a leadership question I'll ask you separately, but real quick, on the workplace shortage, there's a legitimate workplace shortage, is there not? Totally. Real. Totally, totally real. A lot more of factors. Vacant. More jobs are vacant than people looking right now. And for those of us who are skilled, uh, what we've learned during the uh, pandemic is that maybe we don't want to go back to that employer. So, so not wow. only are the job vacancies up, we have a 20-year high, a 20-year high of people quitting their jobs right now. Um, now you got me thinking about all of our team, and I'm hoping, praying that nobody does that with us. <laughs> well, we we have a job to do. I mean, that's our job. Yeah, we do right? as employers to and the mentor and to retain. Yeah, and creating that healthy, safe, productive environment. Hey, John Sarno, for the president of the Employers Association of New Jersey. Thank you, John. You bet. Take care. See you soon. I'm Steve Arbato. That's uh, Mr. Sarno. We'll be right back. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're now joined by the superintendent of the Newark Public Schools, Roger Leon. Roger, good to see you. Great seeing you, Steve. So we're taping on the 22nd of June. What does it feel like to be ending this school year? And then I'll ask you about September in a second. What's it feel like to finish this one, this marathon? Oh my goodness, we are just so happy that the end is in fact near. Uh, it's been a long 16 months uh, for everyone in the school system, obviously. Uh, so we're really, really um, grateful to be at an incredible point in time uh, right now with our seniors uh, graduating in record numbers. Uh, so um, a lot of great celebrations occurring on this very important week. And Roger, uh, people who have seen us before with you know that uh, we have a stand and deliver leadership and communication development program with the North Public Schools. We do seminars, workshops in every public high school, remote or and or in person. So there's a leadership question here. What is the most significant leadership lesson you have learned in the past as we do this program 15, 16 months? Well, I think that uh, amongst the many things, the whole need to be constantly changing is something that in education we really actually 
don't adjust well to. It usually takes time for um, an initiative to take hold. And so what we've learned as a result of the coronavirus is that uh, we are not in control as much as, in fact, we would all like to be. And then constantly changing, the, the being able to adjust as quickly as possible and then communicate the importance of those adjustments uh, to the community at large has been amongst the the greatest uh, learning that I know I've experienced uh, in this room during this time. Sorry for interrupting. Roger, so speaking of learning and adjusting, September, this will be seen throughout the summer into September. And again, the date will be up on the screen. We always disclose when we're taping. What do you believe September 2021 will look like in the North Public Schools? Well, we know that September 2021 is what we're preparing for. And we've learned over the last 16 months that what we prepare may not be what actually resolves. So uh, we want to stay the course. We want to make sure that people are adhering to all of the CDC guidelines and, and taking very, very seriously any and all of the executive orders, whether they're issued by the governor or the mayor in the great city of Newark, because we know that that will, in fact, uh, determine or at least guide or at least influence a lot of uh, public policy and decision making upon our residents. We know uh, that uh, the normalcy of what we expect in September might not be exactly uh, the way we have planned. So there will be ingress procedures that we've implemented since April that we will make sure are in fact in place, that there are egress procedures that we're also going to uh, be following to make sure that the health and safety of all of the students and staff uh, is the first and most important priority and that we are clear uh, on on that. So uh, we uh, expect all of the students to be returning back. We expect that, uh, in fact, uh, the um, procedures that we have in place have been mastered to a great degree by the students who have been in person, will be learned by the students who have been working remotely, and that ultimately, in the end, will create a bridge between those who haven't been in school and those who want to be back. And we're looking forward to that. It's going to be an exciting uh, start to uh, what will in inevitably be one of the most incredible years in this school district's history. Roger, the vaccine initiative in Newark, vaccine resistance in Newark, and by the way, Newark is a metaphor for any urban community across this country. Um, what impact does the whole question of who's getting the vaccine, who's not, who will, who won't, what impact does that have on public education in the city of Newark? Well, our position from the start has been clear. COVID testing and the vaccination, which obviously follow thereafter, are both extremely important towards building the type of confidence that we need to inevitably get into the resilience that will get us through this. Um, do I believe that people need to be COVID tested and vaccinated? I know that it reassures and provides a level of support that everyone yearns for, especially during a time where there is so much uncertainty. So um, we know that uh, in Newark in particular, the positivity rate was really, really high. And so getting everyone tested and advocating for that was paramount. We know that right now uh, we have close to 70% of our teaching staff members who have already been vaccinated. So we know that we had a very, very aggressive campaign and that we know that it has um, decreased over the last uh, couple of weeks, at least the idea of people being vaccinated. We want to make sure that those who uh, um, are going to do it, that they've obviously consulted with their doctor, they're under a doctor's care, and that they go ahead and get vaccinated in any of the locations in the city of Newark or throughout Essex County in particular. I also wanted to mention to you that we have a great big vaccine for teens initiative that started last week and will continue every Wednesday at Westside High School in the evenings on our Lights On program and at Claremont Hospital as we get through the summer. This is just for teenagers, ages 12 to 18 uh, here sponsored um, in the city of Newark by the health department, obviously the school system and uh, our health partners. By the way, in post-production, put up the website for the Newark Public Schools so uh, those in Newark who want to learn more about it can. Roger, can you give me one minute or less on learning loss? How do, how do we identify what learning loss looks like and what do we do about it for these young people? 
So as it relates to learning loss, we want to look at it in two frames. So learning loss, that actually students uh, have not, uh, for whatever the reasons are, um, kept with the academic programming, and then unfinished learning. So that they, there are students that just need more time. We want to actually address both of those. So we're doing that with some intent. Uh, there are tutoring opportunities that we're providing students before the school day, after school, on Saturdays, that we will continue into the start of the next school year to afford students that additional uh, time. We're, we're doing assessments uh, at the start of the year, in the middle of the year, towards the end of the year, to really get a sense of the impact that this has caused and how uh, we are teaching our students to address those needs. Not only academic, but social emotional learning needs that we know our students have experienced from the separation. Everything about coronavirus has impacted everyone so we're targeting all of the students in a with a broad brush and then providing specific needs as it arises student by student across every classroom in every grade in every school across the city of New York. mr superintendent i want to thank you so much for joining us as always we learn from you we appreciate it and um all the best to you and the great team in the north public schools thank you roger thank you steve we appreciate you you got it. i'm steve Adubato. that's roger leon We'll see you next time. To all the viewers on News 12 Plus, this is a bonus, if you will, special question we have for Roger Leone, who is the Newark Public Schools Superintendent. Roger, let me ask you, we've been doing a stand and deliver leadership and communication program for many, many years in cooperation with the Newark Public Schools, seminars, workshops on leadership and communication skills in your high schools. Why is that program so important for your students? Well, I'll actually do one better. Over 25 years of state operation, we have seen many different initiatives. Some have come and gone, some have stayed, but not many have had the type of impact that I believe is critical towards the type of student achievement that we expect from the children in the city of Newark. Stand and Deliver is that example. Uh, this has provided not only self-esteem, confidence, leadership development, these are coaches that are trained and students that are trained, not only on the delivery of a particular argument, a thought, a viewpoint, but to validate that they are important change makers in the world. Stand and Deliver teaches our students that yes, there are better tomorrows, but why wait? Why not start making these impactful moments right here, right now? That's what Stand and Deliver provides our students. Immediate opportunities to not only see a change, but see a change because of them. And we're extremely grateful for the years of service that you, the coaches, Mary, have provided. And we look forward to many years ahead. You know, Roger, we took all that down and we'll be using it as a testimonial. <laughs> you got it. You got, hey, listen, let me make sure that everyone watching on State of Affairs on News 12 Plus knows this. Um, the folks who make our work possible, uh, our funders, Prudential, Robert Wood, Johnson, Barnabas Health, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Franklin Templeton, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, Roger, before I let you go real quick on this, important for foundations, corporations to be supportive of not just what we're doing, but more importantly, in the North Public Schools. Our 10-year strategic plan talks about reciprocal relationships, that it is not only good enough to do well for us, it is important for us to do well for the organization. So we commit to all of the foundations that have provided any type of service to the school system. The district commits 100% return on that investment, that we will make sure that every project that has been undertaken uh, resolves in the actual intended impact of the brilliant thinking that originated its design. We have nothing to say to our foundations but to let them know that we owe them tons, tons of time, energy, and evidence that their work has resulted in incredible fruits for our children in the city of Newark. Well said, Superintendent Roger Leone of the Newark Public Schools. Um, this has been, again, a special edition of State of Affairs on News 12 Plus. We thank you so much for watching. Thank you, Roger, and to the News 12 Plus family. We'll see you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by Prudential Financial, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, NJ Best, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, 
the New Jersey Education Association. Summit Health, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by the Fidelco Group. Promotional support provided by CIANJ and Commerce Magazine, and by NJ Biz. Hi, I'm Joe Roth. In New Jersey, there are nearly 4,000 residents in need of a life-saving organ transplant, and one person dies every three days waiting for this gift of life. One organ and tissue donor can save eight lives and enhance the lives of over 75 people. You have the power to make a difference and give hope. For information or to become an organ and tissue donor, visit www.njsharingnetwork.org. And be sure to talk with your family and friends about this life-saving decision. 